In this module, we try to define the most common hypnotic phenomena. Let's start with catalepsy. Catalepsy is a neurological condition associated with muscular rigidity. Usually the cataleptic limb does not feel any pain, and that's why this phenomenon is important in hypnotic analgesia. As discussed earlier, this phenomenon can be an induction technique and a gateway for the subject to begin the trance. The interesting thing is that the cataleptic limb does not feel fatigue. You should consider asking the subject about conditions like arthritis, joint problems, or vascular insufficiencies before hypnosis. A cataleptic hand is sensitive with these coexisting conditions because the limb loses two most important defense mechanisms, pain and fatigue. Idomotor activity is another hypnotic phenomenon. It's an involuntarily muscular reaction reflecting the subject's thoughts and feelings. The good news is that this phenomenon is common among the patients. So you can have an idea in terms of how and how fast the subject is following your suggestions. Assume you are asking the subject to imagine an elevator is going down. You may say, whenever the elevator gets to the last level, your index finger that I touch now moves and I realize you're in the last level. There is an overlap among catalepsy, ideomotor phenomenon, involuntarily hand movements, and inability to move. Some hypnotherapists assume these phenomena as the same entity. To be on the safe side, we can at least assume them belonging to the same category. Time distortion. Almost always the perception of time is affected in hypnosis. Most of the time the subject feels the trance duration shorter than it is. It is called time contraction. In rare cases, when the subject's experience is not good in hypnosis, the duration of the session is perceived longer than it is. It is called time expansion. To verify if your patient is experiencing time distortion or not, you may ask, Make a guess how long your hypnosis session lasts. Most of the time, when they look at their watches, they are surprised. Amnesia. Post-hypnotic amnesia is different from the retrograde amnesia, which is the result of a brain injury or a psychological trauma, in terms of reversibility. The post-hypnotic amnesia is temporary, and it can be conditioned or anchored to a simple cue. For example, whenever I touch your left shoulder, you remember whatever you have forgotten. Retrograde amnesia is not like that. It takes a lot of time and effort for a patient suffering from retrograde amnesia to remember what is forgotten. Post-hypnotic suggestion can be spontaneous or actively suggested. Clinically speaking, I think there is no point to suggest amnesia actively. The good news is the hypnotic amnesia is safe and transient. Pseudo memory is the other end of the spectrum. Direct suggestions in deep hypnosis can create the memories which do not really exist. One of the reasons I'm hesitant to suggest amnesia actively is the risk of pseudo memories. Having said that, pseudo memory is not a concerning adverse effect and is self limiting. The interesting thing about pseudo memories is sometimes the subject distinguishes between the pseudo-memories and the real memories, while sometimes the subject cannot differentiate between them. Hyperamnesia. In some cases, the subjects can remember things easier under hypnosis. It does not mean all those memories are accurate or reliable. Sometimes even the subjects can lie under hypnosis. The truth is, people can lie easier under hypnosis because they become more imaginative. People can even believe in their own lies under hypnosis and that lie becomes a source of pseudo-memory. Hallucinations. Hallucination can be in two ways, positive and negative. Positive hallucination is seeing or sensing what does not exist. Negative hallucination is not seeing or sensing what really exists. Visual hallucination is the hardest one to experience and is seen in 3% of subjects. Dissociation. 
Dissociation is defined as separation, disconnection, or detachment from the hypnosis room environment. As you know, this is the prominent feature of a special category of highly hypnotizable people. Sometimes you, as the therapist, lose the communication with the patient experiencing dissociation. And in some cases, the subject may present automatic writing while experiencing dissociation. And as a result of that, you discover a lot in terms of what is going on behind the subject's mind and explore the unconscious thought processes. Dissociation can happen in other conditions rather than hypnosis. Under extreme psychological or physical stresses, the mind uses dissociation as a defense mechanism. Actually, this mechanism is the underlying cause of PTSD or post-traumatic stress disease. Depersonalization. When somebody gets disoriented, for example, when a patient experiencing delirium in a hospital, the sense of time is the first impaired sense. The patient cannot recognize what part of the day it is. If the patient becomes more disoriented, he or she also loses the sense of location. The patient cannot recognize and remember he or she is at the hospital. In deeper disorientations, the patient cannot even remember his or her identity. The same sequence is applicable in different depths of hypnosis. Although all the subjects experience some degree of time distortion, some people in deeper hypnosis can experience dissociation. Some of them are able to experience depersonalization. In some cases, the subject can take the identity of another person. Unitive experiences. Maybe the extreme end of depersonalization is the unitive experience. Hypnosis is not the only way to experience unitive experiences, but it's one of the ways. The subject feels the potential to be anybody or anything. Out-of-body experience. The extreme end of dissociation is out-of-body experience. Out-of-body experience is reported in 3% to even 25% of normal population without applying hypnosis. Some people experience that when they are in extreme stressful circumstances. People can experience out-of-body experience in two major ways. Experiencing the world as it is or experiencing a fantasy world with huge distortions and deviations from the conventional reality like meeting a wise hookah-smoking caterpillar in Alice in Wonderland story. Somnambulism. It's a deep trance experience with open eyes. There is a huge overlapping between somnambulism and the phenomena like dissociation, analgesia and anesthesia. The phenomena related to pain are among the most practical and useful phenomena. We know a little about the underlying mechanism of how it works though. We only can apply that in our daily practice. However, it looks like the trance alternates the feeling of pain in a metacognition level. A metacognition is defined as a cognition or insight about another cognition. Let me give you an example. For sure you have experienced that sometimes you don't remember the name of a famous actor who you know very well. The name of the actor is a cognition. The fact that you know that you know the actor is a metacognition. Back to pain relief in hypnosis, while the simple cognition of pain still exists, the subject is unable to feel the sophisticated metacognitions created about and on top of the simple cognition. This theory, metacognition game, brings some controversies around the application of hypnosis in pain management. The same controversies have been around the analgesia and anesthesia as well. In operation room, the anesthesiologist injects morphine to manage the intraoperative pain. Despite the fact that the patient is unconscious, he or she can still feel pain. We can measure the SCEP or somatosensory cortical evoked potential as an indicator of the pain felt by the patient unconsciously. So if the morphine is not injected, tachycardia or hypertension may happen. The same scenario is applicable in hypnosis. If the patient is not feeling pain, we should be aware of the fact that we are just blocking the output of the metacognition system and the patient is feeling pain in another level. 
As a result of that, acute pains, particularly in invasive procedures, are not good indications for hypnosis. On the other hand, patients with chronic inflammatory pains are good candidates for hypnosis. Some people are able to undergo major surgeries under hypnosis. Hypnosis plays the role of both an analgesic and anesthetic for them. Some people can experience analgesia in a lesser degree or more in the affective component of the pain rather than the sensory component. The bottom line is more than 50% of people benefit from this phenomenon. Hyperesthesia. The opposite of anesthesia is hyperesthesia. The affective component of pain is more enhanced in hyperesthesia. I have seen this phenomenon in PTSD patients. Age regression. Age regression is relieving a past event. It's much more than simple remembering of the past event. The voice, facial expression, and even handwriting become childish. It's more like a perceptual change rather than a physiological change. Having said that, sometimes the changes look like so physiological. A classic example of that is Babinski sign. When the sole of the foot is stimulated by a blunt instrument, in normal adults, the response is downward or flexion. The upward response or extension is called Babinski sign. In normal adults, an upward response or a positive Babinski sign is a great suspicion of a serious illness like an upper motor neuron disease. In infants younger than 12 months, a positive Babinski sign is normal. The interesting part is, under hypnosis, when you return the subject to the age of six months or earlier, the Babinski test becomes positive. Age progression. It's like imagining the future. However, the subject feels the experience more realistic comparing to just a simple imagination. Induced dreams. In some subjects, you can change the contents of the dream at night by suggestions. 